Hi, my name is Tiffany Gaines and I am the Curatorial Associate at the Birchfield Penny Art Center, curator of the exhibition, Sharing Our View 25th Anniversary. Sharing Our View 25th Anniversary is a celebration of an original exhibition guest curated by John Baker in 1998, which intended to bring institutional recognition to the legacy of black artists and artistic production here in the city of Buffalo. 25 years later, we are celebrating that legacy as this exhibition bridges the gaps between the historic artists included in the original exhibition and a group of contemporary artists who continue to follow in these artists' footsteps. All of the artists included in the exhibition exhibit a spirit of community, collaboration, education, and access through their work and their engagements in the community. And this exhibition brings them all together to show the rich intergenerational legacy of Black artistic production here in Buffalo. So to bring this together and have a conversation across generations, we are so excited to bring together the artists from uh, both the past and the present that are on view in this anniversary exhibition for a conversation about their experiences, their influences, their inspiration, and what it means to be a Black artist in Buffalo and what that legacy means to them. So we are in store for a very exciting, very engaging and inspiring conversation. John Baker, local artist, curator, art museum educator, president of the West New York Urban Arts Collective. I was originally created the Sharing Our View exhibition 25 years ago as a guest curator for the Birchfield Penny Arts Center. The most enthusiastic thing about it at that point was Sharing Our View had a whole lot of different components that was connected to it. Sharing Our View wasn't just about the artists, but it's also about the community and who they respected in the community as far as the artists that represented them and also to show them who were the up and coming artists. So this conversation is important is because in going to graduate school what I learned is learning the system. Sometimes it's good to be an artist and everything else, but you need to know how the system works and how it's done. And I did an interview a few years ago. The interviewer was talking about my legacy and what I've done and everything. And I said, you know what, that's important and I, and I respect that. I said, but the most important thing to me is if in 20, 25 years from now, if some other young artist has been influenced or benefited from what I'm doing now and what I put forth at this point, that to me is more so important. It's not always what you do as an individual artist, but it's what you do for others and what you prepare them for and what you do for the arts. Because there has to be people in the middle, and I've considered myself as that bridge between the community and the arts community and bridging that gap so there's an understanding between both of them as far as what position they're in, where they stand, and being able to stand in each other and each other's position and where things are. I'm Tiffany Gaines. And I'm John Baker, and this is Sharing Our View 25th Anniversary Artist Legacy. Hello and welcome to Sharing Our View 25th Anniversary Artist Legacy. My name is Tiffany Gaines. I am the Curatorial Associate here at the Birchfield Penny Art Center. And I'm so happy to have you joining us here for a wonderful conversation today. At this time, I would love to invite all of our artists to come to the stage for our conversation. of the Sharing Our View 25th Anniversary Exhibition here at the Birchfield Penny Art Center. 
Um, today we are in store for just a wonderful conversation across generations of artists. We want to hear about your experiences, your insights, the lessons you've learned, the things that you've gone through, and, and the wins that you've shared here in our community. Um, so we are joined by the artists in the exhibition, and if you'll see, there are some empty seats here, um, and that was intentional. We wanted to make space to honor the legacy of some of the artists that are in the exhibition that are no longer here with us physically. Um, even though you know the, the lives, the physical presence of uh, William West, Bill Cooper, um, and Wilhelmina Godfrey, even though they're not here physically, their lives, their legacy, their work, their um, undying influence on our community, it lives on uh, forever. And so we wanted to pay homage to that uh, with these empty seats here today. Um, I'm so happy that you all are joining us, but we also will be joined by uh, Jeanette Shropshire, who, even though she wasn't able to come physically, uh, wanted to participate in this conversation as well. So we will hear from her uh, throughout, uh, through a video that she so graciously put together um, for us today. So before we kind of dive into the conversation, I wanted to take a quick second to introduce none other than my lovely co-moderator, um, the one and only brother Clifford Bell, who will be helping me to facilitate this conversation with you all. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brother Bell to introduce himself. Listen, I think I'm so excited about this because when John Berger called and said that this was part of the celebration of the 25th anniversary of people knowing more about African-American artists and the things they do and appreciate. And I said, I love it, give me a shot. And he respected me because of my age, not because of my knowledge. <laughs> so, so I thank him for that. But what I want to share with you at, at the outset is something that I wrote that I've used for 25 years across the street at Buffalo State College. I want you to put this in your memory bank. That's for everybody, no matter what your age is. It's called Bell's Law. It has three parts. The first is the relationships you form. Number two, the decisions you make. Number three, the actions you take. Now, all of your lives are built around the first one. And it's because of those relationships, one way or another, has influence on you and the fact that you have chosen to be an artist. You didn't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be an artist. Your mother saw you drawing a cartoon or making a little sign or something. And she said, you know, girl, boy, you're pretty good. Or someone saw you and heard you talking and said, boy, now that's got promise. So as we go along this evening, afternoon rather, I'm going to kind of intersect some of these things that I feel will be important for you to remember or have done or maybe thinking about doing. So as we move on, just keep that in mind uh, when you speak. Talk from your heart. Tell us something about how you got to do what you do and the kind of process you use to get yourself together. So th the first question that I have for, for, I can direct it to the panel, but I think I'll direct it to maybe Jim Pappas' sister Foster. I'm leaning more towards someone I feel has quite a background in the art field. And my question deals with how do you feel about getting yourself to paint? What is your motivation? Have you got to create it, or have you got something you have as a pattern? Uh, Sister Foss, I'll start with you first. Thank you, Brother Bell. Well, for me, art is a spiritual gift. It's what bubbles up within you. It's something that speaks from your heart. And so you're not, you're influenced by what you see, but it's also you're influenced by it what you feel. And for me, I'm motivated by colors. I like bright colors, I love them. Um, I'm also motivated by how, how I feel. I'm gonna talk about one of my favorite series and I called it uh, My Love Affair with Blue and Gold. My husband and I, we used to take walks along the waterfront and it was summertime. And every one of those paintings, I did about five, every one of them sold because the way I feel, I made other people feel the same way. It, it's not, I don't know how, it, so art is a skill, yes, but to me, it's what flows out of you. And each of us, all of us, have an individual spirit within us that speaks to others. And you want people to see your 
spirit because beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So you don't want to look at this one or that one or that other and see what they're thinking. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. So somebody may see the colors, some people may see the design, some people may not see anything at all, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, it's what comes out of you. That's well, but James, you took a trial there too. I've seen some of your exhibits here, the multiple in range, and I know you've selected a number of things how do you determine what you feel you want to paint? Well, that's a good question because there are times when uh, I've suspended the paintbrush more to an, another medium, such as screen printing. Now, I spent several years doing uh, screen printing. I went to RIT uh, where I learned, learned the process. And the, the fact that this medium was available at the time, uh, urged me to provide new images and new ways in which to approach, approach art. And at that point I thought I was pretty much innovative because nobody was doing what I was doing at that time. Uh, even when uh, Andy Warhol wasn't uh, doing that. So uh, I could critiqued by my professor at that, at the RIT, and I kind of <laughs> laughed and joked at him because he said that uh, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing at that school. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, that's, that's the whole reason of art, is to create a new idea, a new concept about doing something. As it turned out, it, it worked very well. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. You know, in order to be an artist, you certainly have got to have some imagination and some creativity because a lot of things that you do, you do based on what you were talking about, Betty Jean, and end up being something. Sometimes you may have to even explain it to somebody. So what does that take you, John? You've been around a while and you've done a number of things. And where would you take that? Oh. I think the process is what we have to realize, which is important to our community also, that we're influenced by the people around us, the kind of background we have, the type of people that support us and push us. And that's why we have to make sure that the community is also involved in the process because you also represent them, not only as a member of the community, but as an artist. And you're expressing some of the thoughts that they have that they may not be able to put down on canvas a draw that people can see your work. Say, oh, I remember that. I remember growing up doing that. And you create that visual history for the community. So that's why it's important for a show like this is that people see. That's why sharing our view means sharing not only our artwork, but our concepts, the people in our community, what they think and what they respect, and the history of the artists within our community. And I think to that point, um, John, you are so spot on about this idea of you know speaking to and for the community. And I'd love to kind of bring this question. Um, Itina and Bree, both of you have works in the show that really articulate this idea of you know representing the community, highlighting the voices of those um, in our community. So like what inspires you and, and whoever would like to take a stab at it first, but just just that idea of community just resonated so well with the pieces that you two have um, in the show. So I'd love to hear what your inspirations are for that. Yeah, so <clears throat> my inspirations are always the experiences of uh, me um, and also the people in my community. Um, I, I try to look at how we would see the world, how we view the world, um, and also like social issues. So my piece that's in the show is called um, There Goes the Neighborhood. Um, I think this is a great example of how I like operate. Um, so the title of the piece comes from a word. It comes from like a phrase that we hear a lot. There goes the neighborhood. Yeah. You see when an African-American person maybe goes into a different neighborhood that is not predominantly African-American. And so I, I just wanted to kind of look at that. That's what I usually do. I usually take a a phrase or something that I hear and I kind of spin it and sort of um, just just say what I need to say with that. Um, I think it's 
the, the whole idea of my piece was to basically just tell people who look like me that you can be where you want to be, mm -hmm. wherever you want to live, whatever you want to do, and you can look like you mm -hmm. authentically. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, art is a language and all of the different mediums become these different dialects. And so I think for me, I just wanna showcase art and stories in any way possible, whether it be through music, um, you know, visual arts, any way I can, um, poetry, video, it, it doesn't matter, you know, just, just kind of showcasing these different perspectives. And so Tales from the Porch is just a way to amplify the stories from within the community and have those stories be captured by people who look like the community and um, be able to give uh, individuals who are doing dope stuff within the community an opportunity to have a, a voice, a microphone, and, and what have you. And then in that, everything that I do, I want to incorporate the community in some kind of way because I want the community to see themselves in the process. So just working within the community to find as many creatives as possible to put them together is almost like um, a, color, a color palette and each um, creative uh, does their thing as dopely as possible and um, everything kind of merges together in order to say one thing and that, and that is the fact that we are all human. Mm -hmm. And um, if we continue to focus on that, we can unify a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my, my biggest thing is that we can do that through the power of art. Mm -hmm. Well, we are going to hear uh, from one Jeanette Shropshire, so hang on just one second, we'll hear from her. My name is Jeanette Shropshire. I'm 91 years old. What I see and what I feel are what I put into my art. Well, the color black and white explain a lot to me, and that I hope will explain to you what I'm doing. Um, so that was wonderful. I'm so glad to hear from Jeanette as well. And I think, Itina, the, the thing that you said about, you know, this idea of uplifting and inspiring, I think it's such a great segue into our next question of, you know, what's the responsibility of an artist and, and how do you define success as an artist? Um, and I'd love to kind of come over here and see who would like to maybe take a first stab at what does success mean? What does being a successful artist mean to you? Yes, okay. Actually, um, it, it's, I, I love that question, number one. Um, in my studio, there's a statement that says, um, success is, is liking who you are, it's liking what you do, and it's liking how you do it. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw that, I said, that speaks to my art, you know? if. <laughs> I produce a piece, I like the piece enough to show it to the world, mm -hmm. I feel that it's successful already, you mm -hmm. know. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you've sold 50 paintings mm -hmm. or um, you're published or whatever. Whatever piece you produce, you like it, it's successful. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. Mm -hmm. Trisha, you're going to say something? Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I'd like to speak a little bit to Betty Foster's. Uh, comment and sort of tie that into the meaning of success as an artist um, because it really is a spiritual call it's a calling and I'm I consider myself a successful artist now because of that and also having role models to to who who've um, influenced me to um, understand that you know it's it's about yourself, you know what's inside of you, that that is flowing into your canvas or whatever medium you have, and that's the most important thing. And I'll I'll tell you where I learned that, and it really just made all the difference in the world for me. I took time away from uh, let me see, uh, uh, Kathy Shiroki saw, when I started painting back in the 90s, she saw, uh, uh, I was in a woman's art show, and um, I, I did like this collage piece, and she, she told me that she thought 
and I got an award, like third uh, prize for it. And she said she thought it was really very moving. You know, the content was, was substantial, you know, really great. That she thought it was technically weak. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I took it as a motivation for me to uh, take, to stop trying to make paintings a certain way, but to, to hone my craft. So that, so that I could get through this. So I spent a year painting and drawing uh, with a person who had studied in Italy, the uh, Renaissance painters, master painting, drawing, figure drawing, live models and everything, not concerned about the final product, but the craft. And, um, and I learned that by doing that, I put my my uh, brush on canvas is what's inside of me that comes out. And because I have the craft, I don't have to worry about it. And I've, I sold some uh, monotypes to a major international collector. And um, I had taken some of the monotypes that they're like painterly. And I do them just on plexiglass and then run, run them through the printing press. And uh, I had, had um, a portfolio of these paint, these monotypes that I took to him, and um, he was going through the portfolio, and um, at the bottom of it, I had some proofs where I had been playing around with the ink to get the right consistency and everything, and he was looking at the monotypes, and then he got to the proofs, and I was sitting there, and I was getting ready to say I didn't mean to put those in there, because. I was just, those were test prints. And he stopped right then and he said, you know, this, this is like the it's gestural. He said, it's like really moving me. And it didn't have the figurative, like the, the, the refined figures in it. It was the movement of my hands and what was coming through. And um, I stopped right at that moment and I said, just let him do that. And he took out and gave, wrote me a check for $900 just for these little things that were like proofs. Mm -hmm. And that for me, let me know that I, I was a successful artist because I didn't have to work at what I do. That is, that is inside of me. Mm -hmm. But I have, I have the craft. And Betty, Pe Betty is one of my favorite painters. I love, and, and, and she, you know, it's like that signature. As soon as I see it, Betty, Betty mm -hmm. Foster. And it's so fluid, and you know, and I know she's a spiritual person, and I feel it when I see it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what defines yes, success. Absolutely. You know, uh, study Tiffany, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what's important, every one of you that spoke, thought to you about a relationship. Mm -hmm. That was my number one thing. Mm -hmm. the relationship to form. I just want you to keep that in mind, because all life is built around those three things I gave you. Mm -hmm. In a minute, I can tell, go to the decision part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But from now, I know that all my life and development of it is built on relationships. And if you're careful, the relationships you form, that can be beneficial to your progress. Mm -hmm. And don't pay attention to people who know nothing about art who want to tell you how to draw something. Because <laughs> it's happened to me on more than one occasion. But I listen to the experts. If somebody can't draw a straight line, that's your line, John. How do they know anything about the art? They can't even write their name. So keep that thought in mind. Every one of you, as you speak, are going to be talking about somebody, something that happened or something that did that was a relationship. Very important. So. I'm and I think to that point, um, I'd love to hear from someone, um, you know, I think relationships and having that community, you know, Patricia, you talked about, you know, Betty and just the, that dynamic, that support. How have having relationships with fellow artists helped navigate, helped you navigate or move through challenges, you know, with coming to understand who you are as an artist, what you want to say? Um, how has just being in community with other artists or being, um, having a support system or, or whatever community or relationships look like, to you, how has that helped you navigate the challenges of kind of finding that artistic voice? Yes, um, So I think that even, even this alone is just like, 
it's not it's not common and it's something that needs to be appreciated because I feel like when you're an artist, um, you can kind of feel alone in your own world and kind of feel like there's nobody who can speak the language because like you guys were saying is like it is a spiritual language and it's kind of like the different mediums you use is kind of showing that you perceive a lot of different things and have an appreciation for a lot of different things that people don't have words for. Mm -hmm. So I think that when you have a community of people that also are learning this language and trying to understand this language and know the history of the language, and you can have these conversations and have these people that are successful, you can look up to and know that there's opportunity for you to do what they're doing and also opportunity for you to kind of make a new path for yourself and figure exactly. things out. And I think that it has definitely helped me, especially being in Buffalo, like you wouldn't think that there was such a community like this here of people that are trying to do what I'm trying to do and have been in the same position as me in a different way and in a different time, but still like same issues. It's, it's comforting and you know that it's something that you can carry on and that it's been here before you and it'll be here after. And so to that point, I really want to come to you, James, because as the, the quote unquote, you call yourself, you were the young blood in the original show so 25 good. years ago. And now here you are, you know, being on the other side of, of being part of this historic moment and kind of bridging in this connection across generations. Like how has community and relationships, you know, look, what does that look like for you in overcoming challenges and finding that uh, artistic voice? It saved my artistic life. Um, I got out of school in 93 from Fredonia. And for the first six months, I had this romanticized version of I'm going to be doing all these different projects. And, you know, I had a little taste of success. And sometimes as an artist, we kind of fall in that folly of, you know, uh, what's, what's the phrase, John, reading your own news, read, believing your own press. And sometimes you get a little cocky and then you start realizing reality doesn't work that way. Um, I came into contact with the late, great Bill Cooper in uh, 1990. And he and John were like my beginning saving graces. And then Joanna Angie over at the Buffalo Art Studio. Had I not had those things, I don't think I'd be doing my art right now. Mm -hmm. um, this sense of community is something that I say to the younger artists, please lean on them, reach out um, to the artists that are with me. Let's keep doing this because this is something that we see the success in those young people that are coming up here saying, talking later on. And I want to believe that I'm at least living proof of it because it was times that I wasn't consistently doing my art work, but I had the community to kind of keep me tethered to it. Mm -hmm. um, and as artists, my professor told me, he said, sometimes you're not going to always be able to do your art. You have to become other things. You have to wear other hats. You have to be a facilitator. You got to be a business manager. You might be a carpenter. Me, I'm a teacher. I'm a case manager. And all those skill sets are transferable between. Now, the thing about being an artist, you learn that adapt adaptability, mm -hmm. which is great. And most of us here, Princess and I have talked about this at times. She had to work other jobs. You know, me and Jay have talked about it. Kobe, all of us have talked about it. So we know what it is to wear two hats. We're not just sitting there twiddling our thumbs all the time waiting for something to do. There's always something to do. But that sense of community is like my tether. For me personally, it's been my tether. It's saved my creative life and it's been my peace and my sanity. Um, Buffalo's not the fastest paced place. And there's, there's a double catch with that because on one hand, it's good because it lets you take the time to appreciate certain things, but development-wise, things just take a little longer. Mm -hmm. So I hope that answered it for the most part. No, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And I think before we get to the next question, I'd love to kind of turn to you, Princessa. As a business owner, a gallery owner, you know, you are creating community through the work that you're doing and, and, and having the space to showcase artists and, and to see us represented. So what has that experience been like for you and how has community, or just how have you overcome the challenges that come with, with such an undertaking? Well, wow, that's such a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> we have two hours. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the experience of, of having and running uh, an art gallery, is, is it can be difficult, yet I find the fun in it. So before even having the art gallery, many of you guys that are on stage poured into me. And I got to learn different lanes of art. So before that, I only knew one thing and I was sticking to it, but opening up my world to all of you here had me grow, where I grew into having my own art gallery. And then what I'm doing now is I'm pouring into my mentees. 
which I've been, you know, uh, working with for the past three years and some. So um, it's been a wonderful experience, yet challenging. It's always going to be that, but this is something that I absolutely love. I love it. So it's not work. It's love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we go to the Please. next thing, um, I was listening to everyone speak, um, talking about the community, mm -hmm. um, mentorship, having you know um, people to talk to. So almost everybody here I know, but um, my husband went to school with John Baker, mm -hmm. and they hadn't seen each other in years. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if they ran into each other at Juneteenth or mm -hmm. some, kind of, some kind of festival. And my husband had told me about his friend John. Well, he's an artist, you know, when you see him, we're going to talk to him. I said, okay, okay. So, you know, a couple of years went by. I, I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> <laughs> my husband ran into him. We were out at the park. Mm -hmm. And he said, oh, you know, they started talking. They went to school and all that. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, what are you doing? And John said, well, I just came from New York or wherever he mm -hmm. came from, this, that, and the other thing in my gallery. And my husband, oh, she's still in art? He said, yeah. He said, well, I want you to take my wife up there to the higher levels because right now that stuff is all in the front room. <laughs> <laughs> I want her work out there. And so from that conversation, which I really didn't think, you know, I thought, you know, he's going to help me. Mm -hmm. um, this is where I am now. And that's been maybe five years, mm -hmm. five or six years. Wow. Where I was making work mm -hmm. and I was at a point where it looked good. But it was similar, it was like circular, it was just like the same, it was going in the circle, it's going in the circle. And by having work in different shows and by um, also looking at YouTube and stuff, because I taught myself the things that I do, um, I feel that I have grown to a spot where I wouldn't have reached if I hadn't met him, if things hadn't developed the way that they did. Basically though, I am a loner, so I know people. I deal with people. I'm glad to see them. We laugh, we talk. Mm -hmm. I ask them questions. They're very helpful. There are some people that are here that I have talked to and formed you know, somewhat of a relationship with. But basically, I am a loner. I have always been the person on the outside mm -hmm. watching and formulating possibilities mm -hmm. because I, I, you know, situation comes up and I can see two or three reasons why something. So I tell, you know, that's why I tell little stories. Mm -hmm. So that's about all I can say right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just want to say one thing. As being one of the senior artists now, now I'm looking around this room. You wouldn't believe this, but 25 years ago is what I envisioned is what we're having mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. So anything you do now, trust me, you may not figure it out. I never knew this was going to happen, Absolutely. but just to be here, and I can see look in this room and know I have an association with every artist that's sitting up here as a part of this project. And you never know where it's going to go and where it's going to be and developing those relationships. I want to make sure that you guys know that one day you'll be the senior artist. Okay, then how's your legacy going to continue? It's going to be for younger artists behind you that you've reached out to and mentored that's going to keep your name alive. And that's the important part. And that's one of the components of sharing our view. Mm -hmm. The thought was, as I'm hearing all of you speak again, now I gave you the first three. You may have remembered them or not. If you want to, I'll give them at the end, just so you can relate to what I'm trying to say. The second thing I had a three-word kind of thought about was, and you're in an artistic field, and you're trying to reach out to people. It's very difficult sometimes to do that because everybody doesn't care or doesn't appreciate it. It's a little concern. But I think one of the follow-ups to what John's kind of put together and all you seem to be interested in is these three things. You share information, education, and appreciation. We don't spend enough time selling people on the thought that we have this artistic skill that's been expressed through your imagination and your creativity that they can take advantage of. If it's a picture, like I'm gonna get something I've not decided what Dee's gonna do for me, Dee Edwards. But, but she does well and she's done things for people personally that paid her to do them because she has the skill to give them a picture that they want to purchase. You know, people need to understand this, this is a thing. You're either professional at it or it's a hobby. Now, if you're professional, what you're trying to do is sell your product to something <laughs> like that. You produce it, or you develop a reputation like James has, where he's good at murals. 
He did a mural that's got 18 pieces in it. Or something. He puts them all together and paints them like, like this one picture. <laughs> that's a skill that's worth money. He's made some money. I, I borrowed something from it. <laughs> but, but you understand what I'm saying? Seriously, this is serious enough to, to demand sharing it with people and educating people the importance of it. Sometimes you've got to explain stuff. If you do a painting and somebody asks you, and they may say, well, what is this? Or what are you doing? You can tell them it's about the community. This is the way you can't move. You understand? So that now they got an idea what you're talking about. Because trying to explain a picture to somebody, especially some of the stuff that James had done, I asked him, I don't think he even knew what it was. <laughs> That's because he did it a couple of years ago. <laughs> but you understand where I'm coming from, folks? Be proud of the fact that you have this. Sell it every place you go. Have a sample, have something. Go on every program you can get on. Go to every exhibition that takes place. Yeah. Toot your own horn. No. You know, it ain't about, and that's my next question, because the question was, oh, what does black or being a black artist mean to you? Some have explained this, and, and, and to see it, this kind of presentation is a moral, ethical responsibility of the black artist in particular. But you know, I want to tell you real quick, Brother Bell been around a long time. Most of the stuff I've done and been able to do is because of my relationships. But the second thing is, identify yourself as an accomplished, competent artist that happens to be black. Because that's sometimes we get stuck in that little bag. Somebody say, I want to buy from him because he's black. He's going to do a black Bill painting. No, he's not. No, he's not. He's going to do a beautiful painting, and he was black when he did it. Exactly. <laughs> and you don't have to tell nobody you're black because <laughs> epidermis gets you away every night. You walk in the room, they look at you, they know you're black. You don't have to say, well, I'm black and I'm proud. Exactly. You be proud. Tell them that you're black. Exactly. Don't even count. So how do you feel? Anybody? Because, uh, yeah, I didn't want to add something just because it came from you, you, you because okay. you started this. Brother Bell knows about my, about my family being Absolutely. heavily involved in the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we have uh, that that I would they were they were marching with Martin Luther King yeah. and doing everything on the front lines and then coming home and instilling those values. I in understand us. that. And one one thing that you said about being a black artist, I was listening to Martin Luther King's speech. Yeah. And it, it's called the Blueprint for Life. That he's mm -hmm. talking to some young people. And he says, using the term Negro, don't just be a Negro artist, be the best artist you can be. Mm -hmm. He did about Paint the like people. Picasso. No. Yeah. And then he, he made reference to people who had excelled, like uh, Leontine Price and, yeah. like, and people like that. He said, and about the street sweeper, he said, when you, if you sweep street, be the best, be the best, best that you can be. Mm -hmm. And that I, I keep, I keep, I still listen to that over and over again. Because Even though it's a reference piece now, then I'll let you yeah. go. Because people will say, if you give a painting, oh, that, oh, that didn't go. Oh, he's a black guy. <laughs> you know, what's relevant about that? If he's doing artistic work that the people have bought and paid for, why have you got to be? He's black. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a conversation that takes us away from our real purpose and and, mm -hmm. and, and dignity and everything else. Mm -hmm. Just say, that's Brother Bell. He's a nice guy. Mm -hmm. Because I'm a human being, that identity I additional, I don't need. Yeah, so yeah. That's and, why I just you don't need it. So and like I said before, like yeah. me selling my work, I've sold to international collectors exactly. who saw my work, and they said the first thing that they saw was the brush strokes. Mm -hmm. right. And before, they weren't even thinking in terms of being a black artist. Yeah. And that was what they saw first, and then secondarily, you know, my story. But see, that's the educational part, and I don't let you, somebody else know. Yeah, yeah. You, and, and you, sometimes really you've got to educate people, especially yeah. us, because our familiarity with that is that we know that historically we got more artistic stuff going on two, 200,000 years ago starting in Africa. So, so we don't have to look to no new finding stuff. All we got to do is be ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because and let's have Ms. Betty speak to Oh, them. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I speak to it? Yeah, Ms. Betty, so, she's Betty wants to speak to what, what I'd like to say in response to your question is that um, everybody needs file cabinets in order to understand stuff. And so they, they try to put it in a file and say, well, okay, if it fills, if it fills this 
particular description yeah, that that's what it, it is. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not what it is, it's just something in the file. Mm -hmm. It's that we are all, each of us, a product of our environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And exactly. so who we are is going to speak to our art. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just talk about me again. My first uh, show was a two-man show in Chautauqua. And the show was called Some People I Know. Mm -hmm. All right, that's coming from me. But, and you can put it in the file cabinet of black artists, but it's bigger than that. It's my environment that's talking yeah. so that you see who I am and you see how I'm expressing my personality, mm -hmm. my skill, my art, my love for it, the people that I'm around, because I love the people that I'm around. Exactly. And I want you to see it too. And it's big enough and good enough for everybody to understand that this is wonderful. Love is a universal mm. Amen. spirit, and everybody needs to see it. And, if it's, and it's coming from each of us, good. It's a great thing. Don't be limited by a file cabinet. No, it's <laughs> education. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, yes, I would like, you know I mean, I know you guys have a set of words, but there's a younger artist that I've been discussing this very thing with mm -hmm. for years. I may be an uh, artist, but it just happens to be black. And this is something Kobe Barber and myself have discussed on a number of occasions. And I would like for him to address this and his experience, because we've had some very interesting conversations mm -hmm. in the process of dealing with this. Okay. Call me out. All right. So yeah, so as John says, I've asked that question, like what is black art? Almost every time I have opportunity to put an artist statement up. Mm -hmm. And it, it opens up a lot of conversations to folks. Uh, and a lot of people don't really have an answer for me, what black art is. We all know that that's a category. We all know that we're put into that category, but we don't understand why we're there mm -hmm. and how to get out of that category. Mm -hmm. So I decided that a better question might be, what is white art? Mm -hmm. Because if there's a such thing as a black art, then there's gotta be such thing as white art. Mm -hmm. And do white artists worry about making white art? Mm -hmm. No. And wow. can a white artist make black art? Because if there's, a, there's something different between the two of them, then we have to be able to identify what it is. Mm -hmm. But we keep getting thrown into this mm -hmm. category. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we all do different things. Like every one of you guys, I know all your artwork. I've seen it all around. And everybody does different mm -hmm. things. And we can see what everybody's doing and it could loosely go into a black art subcategory, but it's art mm -hmm. first. And then our communities, our influences, everything that's around us affects us. So if we're painting black people, it's because we're around black people. Mm -hmm. We're playing back themes because we, we're affected by those things, but it doesn't mean, that doesn't define who we are mm -hmm. as an artist. Mm -hmm. We should be always creating art, period, mm -hmm. that happens to be made by a black person. Mm -hmm. Iris, you had something you want to respond? So it's a double-edged sword because mm -hmm. I just saw an article a couple days ago. I was in the airport, and um, what people were complaining about was that this black art that they were looking at was not made by black people. Mm -hmm. And so the artist and um, the moderator were saying, you know, what well, do they have the right mm -hmm. to interpret what black life looks like? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't have an answer for that, but I do know that as an artist and a human being, as a black or an African American or whatever category is in vogue, mm -hmm. I don't want to disappear. Right. I don't want the work that I do right. to somehow lose the connection to who I was. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. And I think to that point, um, and I'll come to you next, um, I think to that point, that's why this work that we're doing here of you know, documenting these conversations, cementing this legacy of all of you as artists, but also this generational desire to you know, speak to black art in a way where it's nuanced, where there's, blackness is not a monolith, right? And I could go on all day about that because I just wrote a thesis about it, but I won't do that. <laughs> Um, but just this idea of allowing multiple voices, multiple experiences, multiple ideas of blackness to coexist, I think is something that, you know, is, is happening in this work that we're doing. Um, as you said, there's so many representations of, of artistry here on stage that it's all black, but it's all beyond that as well at the same time. And I think just 
creating the space for all of these ideas, these nuances, these sometimes contradictions of what it means to be a black artist, especially in a time as, as contentious as now, it allows us to kind of comfortably sit in this idea that there's no clear one answer, one definition. And we're gonna turn yeah, to another scene and then we'll go to you. That's pretty okay. much what I was just gonna say is like we do have to be careful about, about like hyper categorization of stuff because because we live in capitalism, like they're gonna try to resell us every aspect, like every single filing cabinet, like anything can be put into a filing cabinet and they will sell every single one of those. So we do have to be careful of that. And I do I do agree it's like Asking what a black artist is is like asking what it means to be black. Like every single person is gonna have a different experience and us expressing ourselves in our work is what makes it black art. And like you asking like what is white art, like I don't think that that's a thing. Like I think, like because like I think that black art is a category, it's a filing cabinet. Like they gave us that to name it, but it's not, it's not really real, like it's not like it's like Asian art and all. Like yeah, there's categories and like things that come from certain places, but like it doesn't. It's not really real. Like you know, I'm a black artist, but like would you be able to tell if there wasn't like a black person in my work or if there wasn't if I didn't paint a certain way? You know what I mean? So I think that that's interesting, and we have to be careful. Um, I, I looked this up on the internet. What classifies someone as an artist? In much of the world today, an artist is considered to be a person with the talent and the skills to conceptualize and make creative works. Such persons are singled out and prized for their artistic and original ideas. That's the description of an artist. And some people are considered artists that don't do that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> There's some people that don't come up with original ideas that are well, considered artists too. They can, they can think about it. Yeah. <laughs> they have a mind. So That's I fair. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to touch James. on this. James. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. Let's hear from James. No, James, we'll go ahead. please in. Go ahead, James. I was just going to say that this whole gathering of us is a contradiction in terms, particularly as it relates to the title. Mm. You know, black, uh, black artists. So forth. So what we've been talking about is really not about ourselves as black artists, but basically creative people who have come together to uh, bring a force of um, timeliness, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that we're not living in this kind of reality when we're doing our, our, our art but we're really working as people who are just interested in this particular pastime, mm -hmm. this way of exactly. doing things. Exactly. And uh, so I, I, I think in my own sense, I wasn't raised as a black artist, I was raised as an artist. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, mm -hmm. even though I was copying stuff, you know, as a child, um, comic books and things like that. I went beyond that because I, I was concerned with an, an identity, which I really didn't take that seriously. In other words, I didn't say, okay, I'm an, I, I'm an artist for the sake of being an artist, but I was an artist because of that mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. pastime. And, when we really sit down and think about it, um, we're practicing an illusion, let's put it that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, for that purpose, uh, I'm a contradiction because my name is Pappas. It's not a black name, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not a white right. name. <laughs> and so I embraced it because it's something well, well past me. Now, most of you probably don't know who I am, but I've been around for 80 some years. years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as long as me, but, but not quite. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> so, but I, I think, again, I think of myself as a person who happens to be work, working and sustaining mm -hmm. in a, uh, a position of creativity and the process of that creativity mm -hmm. is what I hope people appreciate. Now, they may not understand it. I don't even understand it myself. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
and my work comes from inside, internally, uh, not so, so much influence, influence from around my community, but that's a part of it, obviously. But internally, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in it. producing works of art that are unique to my own mm -hmm. uh, character. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm, I'm loving this conversation. I'm so glad that everybody's sharing what they're sharing because that's how I feel. I, I, I'm a bit tired of the, the label, if you will, because I feel like for me, I'm a human being mm -hmm. who has this creative energy that I cannot escape. Mm -hmm. And I have a language of art that I've been provided with understanding a little bit more. Like coming from where I come from, I didn't know I was... I didn't know I had what I had in me, I you know, it, until there were individuals who said, hey, you, you, you know, you're pretty creative. Mm -hmm. um, coming up in the foster care system, you're labeled mm -hmm. continuously, and mm -hmm. all it is is you'll be this or you'll be that, or the statistics exactly. are against you. And the minute that I saw something different and embraced that and be, began to, you know, utilize the language of art mm -hmm. to really respond to my surroundings, mm -hmm is when I became free mm -hmm. with, you know, within myself, I feel. And so when, I, when we hear these labels of black art or yeah. you know, these categories and these right. spaces, it's, it just it never really sat right with me mm -hmm. because you categorize me by the way that I look, but you don't even know what's internal right. and what, what can come out of me. I'm educated, you know, I worked yeah. hard, I have work ethic, you know, I love people um, and I showcase that through this language of art through these different uh, mediums. So I'm, I'm just loving that, that yeah. conversation, if you will. And this is Great. what we spoke Great. about or mm -hmm. showcased in, in these truths at Albright Knox. Mm -hmm. If you walk through the wall, if you walk through the um, space within Northland, you would have saw a, a huge difference from one wall to the next, because mm -hmm. black art, if you will, mm -hmm. is not a monolith. Mm -hmm. Continued, continuously showcase that if you looked at this work and looked at a Picasso piece, you could you tell the difference or you know whatever the case is in that it can live with with each other but among any kind of artist or any any type of artist. And I think that's such a great segue into this next question because we've been talking about just how layered it is of, of navigating these waters, of being categorized, of, of you know, being inspired by your lived experience, your cultural identity um, intuitively, but also the restrictions that come with that in this, in this space of <coughs> being defined or relegated into the category of black artists as we've kind of been talking about. So with all of that kind of swirling, I'm curious, and I kind of want to start with um, Jay and Jalen because your work really in the show incorporates this imagery of um, this, this history. And Jalen, not so much in the work in the show, but some of the other work we looked at. But I'm curious, like, what responsibility do you feel um, for, as an artist for your work to deconstruct or reimagine certain narratives, right? Like, I'm thinking about the history of the black experience and how that becomes an influence in our work, but at the same time, not wanting to be compartmentalized and boxed into these categories. Um, so Jay, I'll kind of start with you because your piece, St. Harriet, is just such a beautiful homage to Harriet Tubman and I think is very indicative of this layer of, you know, influenced by being black, right? That's something that just is, but also wanting to extend beyond that and be recognized as an artist, as a human, as we've kind of talked about. Um. Uh, yeah, I think it. Well, my goal with that, and I've, I've loved this conversation as well, because it gives us all different ways to look at things. Um, so far, uh, I, and I agree with everybody, um, as far as it being something that's labeled, something that you don't necessarily get to have a choice in, because whatever you put out, whether you're just a human creating it by your derma, it'll be labeled exactly. as black art. Mm -hmm. But it's, and like you also said, it's a decision. Mm -hmm. I decided to be a black artist, mm -hmm. right. you know, right. through because our identity is uh, many parts of our identity is is hard to wrap our minds around, hard to understand. You know what elements of myself, what natural things that are naturally, what am I doing of my culture that, as a black African American in America, you don't even really know. Mm -hmm. What parts of my culture are actually the positive parts of it? 
What are the parts that are made negative? What are the parts that aren't my culture that I feel like are, are you know, habitual to me? You know, and if we can think about us as the humans and as, as, as our story is one, you know, if we can put those thoughts, those images, you know, as a way to, for it to be educational. You know, there's so many black of us that are misinformed, misdirected, misguided. And if your art can lead them to understanding the plight of your blackness, then I'll be a black artist all day. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm leading you to better understand the problems that face us all. If you can see my art and recognize it move you in any way, that must mean this is something that is universal. Hence, it wouldn't mean nothing to you. You know what I'm saying? So with putting St. Harriet in that light, you know what I'm saying? It was selfless. You know, she could have, things selfless acts like Nelson Mandela and, and Harriet Tubman. I could have did this, but I chose. I made a decision. Exactly. You it's know what I'm decision. saying? And that, and that had an effect and had an effect generationally. You know, I just seen a, a, a cartoon, one of those uh, bits that be in the uh, newspapers. It was uh, the black history teacher in our school. It, um, it was, I was in his classroom and I seen that little, little cartoon. It was like Nelson Mandela going in, the first caption was you know, him going into jail. Get in there, Nelson. And then um, and next, it was him coming out. Yeah. And it was like the guy like that ought to teach him. And when he came out, he was bigger, yeah. proportionally bigger than the prison, bigger than the guards. Yeah. Locking him up made him bigger. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's, 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 it's a conscious decision, I feel like, because you can be an artist and represent. It's, those are great questions. Can you be a white person and speak to the black plight? Mm -hmm. if, if, if it's correct, then yeah. You know, if, if that's what you see and if this representation of what you see, then yeah. Or could you be a black artist and not make art that is black? It could be a bunch of happy colors. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. It, that's but, a a choice, but a choice. But a choice to show it because it comes with education. Right. It comes with empowerment. It comes with a story and a narrative and a bit of inquisitiveness to know who am I for real? And if, if the art we create can help that narrative, that's we right. come out bigger. That's right. That's right. Um, so, <laughs> what do you say? So, thinking about this conversation we're having around just the, the nuance and the layers of navigating, you know, being an artist, being a black artist, you know, is there, uh, what responsibility do you feel uh, for your work to deconstruct de uh, or reimagine certain narratives? And I particularly wanted to ask you this because a lot of your work deals with telling the history of the black fight and, and just bringing new attention, as Jay kind of mentioned, to this, this history to bridge understanding. So. Love to hear your thoughts. Yes, my work is constantly deconstructing certain systems and reimagining them from a perspective of what things can be mm -hmm. and the benefit of mm -hmm. my audience. Mm -hmm. And so I'm constantly taking that, that step as I'm going through my creative process, especially when I'm in the, in the form of uh, documentation. Um, I do my best to remove my own biases out of the information that I have received that I'm inspired by to create, to give the viewer an opportunity to uh, have as a pure experience as possible with mm -hmm. the work and to mm -hmm. gather their own interpretation of it. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's not easy, mm -hmm. but however, it is a challenge that's worth taking in order to create that authentic moment mm -hmm. with um, the viewer or with the, co or with the collector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Doretha, I'm interested in your thoughts about this question too, because I think similarly your work, you know, speaks to these. I've I've noticed that a lot of your work has these quiet moments of just day-to-day -day experiences of blackness kind of in, imbued within it. And so I'm curious what your thought is about this question of you know reimagining or reconstructing certain narratives. What what obligation or responsibility do you feel in doing that as an artist? Um. When I first saw that question, mm -hmm. I thought it would be difficult for me to answer okay. it. So, and it's funny because I got the question. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, I, I tend to um, either um, show work that is easily identifiable or representational, mm -hmm. and I go from one end to the other, um, speaking of drum man that's mm -hmm. in the show, mm -hmm. it's a, a little bit more simplistic mm -hmm. than um, my 90% of portraiture work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I mean, it's, 
again, that's a difficult question for me. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm going to defer it to somebody else. <laughs> 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 because that was the best I could do. Yeah. I mean, I struggle with it, to be and honest And I think with you. that is indicative of like just the conversation that we're having, of just that there are no clear mm -hmm. answers. There's yeah. no clear or one way to navigate these. These ideas, these concepts, you know, so that is totally okay. Patricia, you had your. Yeah, I think another way to look at it, and I'm exploring it in my body of work, is um, the ancestral, my ancestral roots. Mm. And um, I was fortunate to um, get pieces of quilt from my great grandmother and my uh, grandma, my a full quilt from my grandmother. And to look at those pieces, I mean, they, they're like abstract paintings. And it was like, that's where my talent comes from. You know, mm -hmm. it's, a, um, it's, it's in my DNA. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was fortunate that, you know, I was encouraged as a youngster to, to paint. Mm -hmm. But I see that and I'm including that in, in my, in referencing that in, in my work. Mm -hmm. And it's really deep because I see it very, very clear, mm -hmm. clearly. And then I was re I've been reading uh, Alice Walker and Toni Morrison mm -hmm. about root rootedness mm -hmm. and their creativity and where it comes from mm -hmm. and it, that inspired them. Mm -hmm. Alice Walker's um, In Search of Our Mother's Garden. Mm -hmm. She talks about her mother's quilts, the flower gardens, mm -hmm. and all of that. And they they in their gen in that generation didn't have the opportunity that we have to do what we're doing. And, we, and I see myself carrying that on and um, acknowledging where, where it comes from. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I didn't just land here and start doing this myself. It, it's, okay, so we're going to very quickly go to Bree and then Iris, and we've got to move to the next question. Yeah. yeah, it's really quick. I just wanted to say, like, we're talking about history. Each of us, as artists, we're history keepers. Like, mm -hmm. whatever we do is about the time. It's It's... It's got historical it's, significance. It's just no historical. What. And like you said, Mr. Baker, like, you know, we're we're making sure that we can pass something down, mm -hmm. that we can we can share where we were in the world, share our view. Um, and I think that's just really important. We that's I think that's our primary mm -hmm. responsibility. Yeah. So um, I tell stories with the art that I make. Mm -hmm. And I tell stories of like the little moments, the private moments. Mm -hmm or you interface with yourself, or you bring how you feel to wherever you are, mm -hmm. because there is um, more to black people than mm -hmm. anger and sorrow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that's basically all I have to say. Mm -hmm. I have an advantage, some of us that are older have a little more information to draw from now. Not that uh, Sister Carter is older, but she came along during a time where a lot of this stuff was prominent, it was newsworthy, and they had stuff. We must learn to produce things that we can sell because we are already sold on it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So don't have, don't feel like you're necessarily responsible. You're responsible to do the best you can to produce an artistic piece. Mm -hmm. But sharing that information with someone else comes under the heading of what I said, education. Even with white folk that call us black art, they need to be educated that we're black artists, but we don't necessarily want to be saved when you sell something. Because let me tell you something, they made millions of dollars within the last 10 years in America selling black stuff in every store you went to. They had all kind of black figures and black uh, uh, statues and everything selling black artists. Nobody was made, nobody black was making any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you want to sell something, it's got to be, first of all, important to you and the ability to sell it by Telling somebody what it represents, what it means, because everybody doesn't have the same experiences. See, I, didn't, I was in all the marches. I was in Washington at the foot of the a pool when, when Martin made his speech, I had a dream. I've been in all the organizations. But see, I'll be 94 this year. Mark was, on, was born 1929, so I had the same year, and I promoted his programs for over 30 years at Shays Buffalo, and I'm working with a group now that's modernized and updating Martin Luther King Jr. Park. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm only saying that to say there's a lot different between Brother Bell and what he experienced. And my folks were born in, all my brothers were born in Iowa on the farm. Mm. 
You understand? So there's a lot of different things. Some of us are a little older. We got a little different relationship and experience. For the young people, they got to develop their own based on their commitment to their work. And if they're as proud of it and you want to make it right, because let me tell you something, nobody but Jesus was perfect. So do the best you can. At some time, you got to put the brush down and say enough is enough. But keep your presence and keep that incentive that I'm just not going to quit. I'm going to put this brush down. But after I eat breakfast in the morning, I'm going to pick it up again. With the <laughs> <laughs> it's important that you know that. You got to know people love you and support you. But they don't know who you are and what you're doing. So how can you expect any kind of support? So publicity. John, I've tried to work with John. I'm an old man. But I just think we have to rig something that has more presence so they can learn to appreciate both your skills and your work. I think that's a great segue to the next question, Brother Bill. Is that my question? Yeah. <laughs> you see what happened when I get lost in this? And you're talking about, uh, we're almost talking about how, how this artwork is, is affected by your career. How do you decide to do things? I mean, I just want to hear somebody tell me, if you're thinking about painting, is there anything you go through personally to prepare yourself? Or, or do you wake up during the night and decide you just saw something you get up and try to scrap draft or, uh, something up? Somebody tell me how you're affected by that. Come so, on, now. yeah, you know what both, I'm both things. So okay. yeah, I, I used to wake up in the middle of the night, and I got my station already set. So before I had the gallery, everything was in my house, in my room, <laughs> and yeah. I'll roll over to the other side yeah. of the bed, and I have everything all set up. Yeah. Or what I'll do is I'll write my notes, because there's words that may pop out, or maybe I did experience something that day, or it affected me emotionally, and I transfer that into my artwork. So a lot of my artwork, it may show happiness, it may show hurt, it may show, you know, whatever it is. So art is emotional. And I've always explained that to, to my younger artists, you know, uh, draw or paint how you feel. You know, what did you experience? Did you watch a movie today? Yeah. Did it make you feel some type yeah, of way? Exactly. Or did, did you see a color or a pattern? So those things influence me and I transfer it into my art. Um, but yeah, I wake up in the middle of the night sometimes and I start, I write things down. I write things down or I'll start doing something. Absolutely. Well, I'm a, I'm a poet and I do that all the time. Oh, yeah. Some of I my used best to poetry, poetry was written <laughs> when I opened. Yeah. <laughs> okay, someone else on that? John. I'll say something that phone. I'm sorry. Oh, and John. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting that, it, that we're going this direction because I'm thinking about a piece that I started out with and I showed my students because most of your art students, like, Mr. Baker, are you just an art teacher or are you a real artist? <laughs> <laughs> you really see <laughs> And I had a series in there that's a part of it, it's called Black and White and Color, where I dealt with social issues. There was like three paintings in there on Negro League Baseball. And the way I did it in the concept, it was about everything being black and white and gray, except for the people of color, who I did in color. And the interesting thing about that is, it was one of the first shows at the new, um, when the airport was new, and I had a sign-in book, and I had information, and people signed in from all over the world about this, and did a show in, in D.C. They said, Mr. Baker, would you have a problem if we submitted this for U.S. Postal Stamp? When I was thinking about becoming an artist, I never thought about having anything submitted like that, but those kind of opportunities present itself, whereas when I did it, I just wanted to get a message across about the situation and what it was. It wasn't about being black, it wasn't about being a black artist, but it connected to people and it crossed so many different boundaries. That was unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, great, that's a great point that kind of leads me to this question of like, you're, you're speaking so well to how your work has you know, resonated not just here locally in Buffalo, but has been expanded beyond to have this national, international reach, right? And so I'm curious what being here in Buffalo, living and working in the city of Buffalo, how has that affected your artwork and your career? And what do you hope to see to come out of Buffalo's um, arts ecosystem in this renaissance, you know, going forward? And maybe John, I'll start with, oh, Ms. Betty. Well, what I'm hearing you say is upside in, and what I've always been saying is inside out. <laughs> <laughs> and so inside out is what motivates you no matter what. And whenever I get stuck or whenever I, I don't like what I'm doing, I'll take a class or I'll talk to, to other people. 
I will look and get a different point of view so that I can see exactly what needs to come out. Mm -hmm. So I always try to do inside out, not outside. Mm -hmm. You know what, Jalen, I would like to speak to this because of some of the work he's been doing lately, mm -hmm. not only with view from traveling and everything mm -hmm. else, it reminds me how I was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. I wish I still had that age, that energy, <laughs> <laughs> but I would like him to address that, what he's doing. Mm -hmm. You know, being in Buffalo inspired me to leave. Inspired me to leave and to take the experiences and knowledge I've accumulated and the relationships I've cultivated into the press of the world and bring that back to Buffalo. Um, because it was this city that gave me my opportunity to hone in and develop and cultivate my artistic gifts and my love for entrepreneurship. And so whether regardless of what the, the benefits or the rewards that come from that, that's just my loyalty at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So every time I leave and I'm able to make those necessary connections and to find resources mm -hmm. that can advance the culture of the arts community in Buffalo, mm -hmm. then I'm here for it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel similarly. Um, Buffalo is, is really a diamond in the rough. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. but it's it's no, there's no um, like I feel like I was supposed to be born here because of the the way of my life. Like I f I feel the same about me, a diamond in a rough. I didn't even know um, until there were individuals who picked me up and said, "Hey, you know, you you were you're this." And I'm like, "Oh, oh yeah, okay. Let me try to figure this out." Mm -hmm. But um, it's always gonna be home. So mm -hmm. no matter where I travel, near or far. Um, I, I like to represent the little east side of Buffalo um, and anybody who um, comes across me in any regard, um, they're able to get a, a sense of, of Buffalo through whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And then like back to the, like, the art, um, in the middle of the night, right, seems like it's always that three o'clock in the morning yeah. for me, just around that time, I, I have no choice, you know, whether it's writing, whether it's um, drawing, it, it doesn't matter. And then being able to express, which has always been difficult for me, being able to express myself, and like I really believe it's language, yeah. and there's many different dialects, and I feel it's a gift and a curse, because I can write a song or write a piece of poetry, but I can also visualize it in a, in a short film, then I can like, okay, that short film can be a documentary. I was like, okay, here are the colors that you will put on the canvas. Like, I have to tell myself to calm down. <laughs> like, that, like, that's a lot. Right. And, um, but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, chaotic mm -hmm. journey to have within me. And I, I'm, I'm grateful for this, this way of expression, even though it drives me crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful for the um, creative expression because it leads me to those places, those different mm -hmm cities or you know countries or, or wherever the case is mm -hmm. to be able to express myself and then I don't have to say I'm black. Mm. Come on. They see it. Come on. <laughs> my, my authenticity, you know, just, you feel it. And then what's beautiful is that I get to shift perspectives on what a black woman is. Mm. So yeah. when I step into the room and I get to talk and, and I, I will talk eloquently, but I'm gonna give it to you true too. Mm. So I, I get to showcase all of these different versions of me and they get to um, anyone, I don't care what you look like, you get to experience someone who you may have thought, like I get it a lot, like, oh, I, 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 you, wow, what, what is this? Like, <laughs> it's me. Come on. You know, it's me. <laughs> and what you thought was black, you may think differently. Because mm -hmm. I get a lot of, oh, you speak so eloquently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. What did you expect? Right. <laughs> you, don't seem, you don't seem like you're from here. Oh, oh you're from the east side? It's because you've already been banged. <laughs> yes. It doesn't matter. Okay. People's anticipation of most of us when we don't sound, because there's a couple mm -hmm. of things that people really fear about us as black folks. Mm -hmm. One of them is your money. And the other one is your intelligence in their presence. Mm -hmm. You can look through any history you've yeah. ever studied. You find someone that, is, that don't take no prisoners and is well-spoken, is always respected. Always. That's why I tell people all the time, 
I'd rather you respect me than love me. Mm. People don't kill the one they respect. Exactly. But they'll kill their wife in a minute if they message is wrong. <laughs> and that's very important because when you're selling something, you gotta show the commitment you've made to the peace mm. is why it should be valuable to them. And then some of them might have a common experience. Some, some of us share the same kind of experiences, not at the same time in the same way, but they can adapt. And the most people want to be respected. And that's when you will sell your product. Two things need to happen. The people that judge your product for its authenticity and its excellent have got to give it some kind of consideration or rating because the people that follow what they recommend will pay you for your stuff. Mm -hmm. We don't have anybody recommending our stuff because we're not selling enough to each other. Mm -hmm. So if somebody mentions your name, even if you won an award on television, unless it was printed on the, in the Challenger, you maybe never see it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the other thing, buy, buying our work. We have uh, to that, buy from each other. And listen, yeah. take a little licking. Don't be oversensitive. I've been called out my name many times. I just correct them in the same tone of voice. Anger gets you nowhere, it just upset you and make you miss a meal. <laughs> but if you keep your control, love what you do, pay homage to it, and yourself for getting it done. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Let's hear from 13. Um, I was just gonna say that I completely agree with what you were saying um, in respects of kind of like the mentality of working in this city, because I do feel like living in Buffalo because of how real it is here, especially like um, economy wise, mm -hmm. like you can really see where the money goes. And so I feel like in my artistic process, like it is a lot of like yelling and screaming of ideas. Like it's not even just in the middle of the night, it's all day long, no matter what. It's like no, every song I listen to, I imagine a music video or like I imagine like, I'm imagining scenes and animations and things yeah. like, I'm imagining in work that I'm not even able to create yet, and like, like I'm making like, I make the work that I see in the world that's in my mind that I want to be Buffalo. Like I imagine Buffalo in like hyper real, like, you know, cyber city type vibe, and like, where I live is kind of more gray, and like you know, <laughs> you know, it's a little bit more real, and so like, it is very much a stark contrast, and that kind of just like, makes my mind even more like hyperactive because like in my home that's what it looks like it's like everything is like bright and pink and like yeah. flowery and detailed because that's what I want to see and put out and I think that like you were saying earlier that it's kind of it is kind of in our blood I feel like that is what makes it black art is us having the courage to see what our culture is and know that some things are good and those are the things that we need to keep and push forward. Yeah, but I think that I think that the blackness comes from seeing what we don't want and pulling from cultures because exactly. being Af mm -hmm. like being black in America is about making your own culture. Like that's all we've ever done. And so I think that being a real artist is always finding what you appreciate in your culture and in others and using that to kind of make a new culture and make a new reality for yourself. And that's kind of what my work is always like, new reality, like new, something I've never seen before, or something I've always wanted for myself, you know? Mm -hmm. That's good, that's good. What becomes black art. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Your work is very, very dreamlike. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I watch a lot of anime. <laughs> the one thing I just want to say is, I mean, it's an honor to be sitting here at this stage 25 years later, but I like the generational thing also. And there's two people here that I've dealt with that have been here the longest that's involved in this. And that's how Mr. Pappas and Betty Foster, who helped create the Langston and Hughes and the things that go along with that. And I think this is something that they can address because they, like over 50 years, there's a transitional stage. And trust me, just a few short years ago, this wouldn't have even been possible. But they know what they know what is takes and the work has been done to get to this phase. And I would like for them to kind of address this and some of their experience in the process. Mr. Pappas. Uh, kind of lost for words because every single person here has contributed so much to what I uh, embrace. And 
I got to know every single one of you a little bit better because of this uh, gathering that we are having. So that now I can actually see a, a name and put a connection onto it. And that is the beauty of this, 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 this whole gathering is that somehow we can all embrace each other regardless of where we're coming from and that uh, we we'll all have a greater appreciation of what we do. And in regards to the question, uh, I forgot what it was, but. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Talking about being one of the original founders. Of there is, yeah. Some uh, of the experiences you had. Yeah. But you've been out here a few years. Right. <laughs> I've been knowing you, I've been knowing you 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've taught 50 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, each one of us uh, is beyond this artistic skill and ability to be, uh, be human beings who embrace one another in this, particularly in this gathering. The freedom to talk to yourselves mm -hmm. and about yourself was really just fascinating yes. to me. Me too. Mm -hmm. Because now you're more than just a name. You're a person mm -hmm. that I can relate to. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is really great. Uh, when we found, found the Langston Youth Center, um, Betty and a few others that were involved in that process, we were a strange item because that had never happened before for a few people to get together at each other's home and discuss discuss what was missing culturally from our our uh, existence. And as we had these conversations and we drew upon our own experiences, we began to amass a philosophy and a uh, idea about one of the ways in which we could relieve that uh, confrontation. And so uh, are with a lot of work and connection with different people and churches and businesses and so forth. Uh, we just, things seem to come around uh, pretty well because there wasn't any, anything existing. I mean, African Culture Center now is beginning a new life, starting uh, to uh, Mature, yeah, mature is an institution in the community. And um, I have great hopes for, for what they're doing, despite some of the issues that are, they've been confronted with. Uh, I think that in the long run, Buffalo and this, this uh, community will uh, finally come to uh, fruition in terms of like basing its growth on the activities that we've all accomplished in our own lives. A couple of words. Um, one of the things about Langston Hughes Institute was it not only was it a doing organization, in other words, we had printmakers, we had oil painters, we had drawing, we had people who were doing dancing, we had uh, people who were doing, uh, Wilhelmina Gottfried was there, she was doing wall hangings. Mm -hmm. I said, so it was a bunch of doing artists, it was a bunch of teaching artists. We had students coming in, we gave shows. Not only that, not only that, that's what was so exciting. Not only we were teaching, we were doing, but we were opening up to other avenues, other towns. We had shows in D.C., <laughs> we had shows in Chautauqua. Romare Beard came in from New York City, picked up our work, got a book, emerging artists, all of this. I mean, so it was like a, a bomb. <laughs> it had so many shoots going all over, and it was covering everything. Everything that we talked about, one of the best things about being an artist and remaining an artist is to stay with artists, talk to That's them, right. see, what, right. see what's That's coming, right. because the energy it's from the people who are the spiritually motivated people. Mm -hmm. You, get, uh, if you get a downtime, 
talk to some more artists. Yes. And so that was a place that you were rejuvenated, blessed. <laughs> it was an awesome place. That's all I can say. It was really great. Actually, I'd like to say, Miss Betty, I was a part of that. I was a product oh, okay. of Langston oh, Hughes. So when I was a kid, uh -huh. I would walk up to High Street uh -huh. and I would learn you know, the craft, and when I was in my uh, early 30s, I taught art there. Mm -hmm. So you guys laid the groundwork, yeah. you know. It, it, um, it, it was, and they say, yeah. it, was awesome. <laughs> it, it was, it was all of that. So thank you for that. Thank I remember you Mama, Ju Mama Judy, as we called her, uh, she was a craft maker. And this was her experience in selling her work. And we put a store together, and she made dolls, and she sold them just like that. <laughs> and bless her soul, she's probably up in heaven now, obviously, because she was about 80 years old at that time. Oh, she's mm -hmm. going. Yeah. <laughs> That's 20 years ago. That's 20 years ago. <laughs> That's right. 40 years ago, uh, I was in the Common Council, and we funded the Langston Hughes Center, them and all the community organizations to keep them alive. And when I was chairman of the Economic Development Committee, we set aside money and help them get vans and help them pay the bills. In fact, we fought very hard to keep Langston Hughes on high feet because Mayor Griffin tried to take it over to turn it into a health location. Now you see what's happened in a sense, but we were trying to get contracts to get for Langston Hughes to get them some that you put some on somebody's tongue to get their temperature, of little portable things like that, that that they could build, develop, and sell to the hospitals and whatnot. It never really materialized, but they have beautiful space, about three stories in space, and uh, Georgia Arthur and Jimmy Pitts and, and Dave Collins and, and Herb Bellamy and myself for at least, I don't know how many years, but every year when the money came, y'all got some. Come on. So that was the part of the road I was fortunate enough to be able to play. Well, that's such a rich history, and I hate to cut the conversation <laughs> short, um, but we did uh, an amazing exhibition about the early history of the Langston Hughes Center. Um, we had a wonderful discussion with Betty Pitts Foster and um, Jim Pappas and, and others just wonderful. about that legacy, and it's just so wonderful to hear and see the influence that it has had on the, the conversation on the artists that are here today. Um, we are going to quickly turn to uh, Jeanette, who had a few words to say about um, where working and living in Buffalo's arts ecosystem. So we're gonna turn over to her before we get into our last question of the afternoon. Well, it's what I see and feel I put in my art. So Buffalo is in my art. In five or 10 years, what do you hope will have been created to support the arts in Buffalo? just that it's more open to everyone. All right, and so um, for our last question, as we kind of wrap up this conversation, um, I think such a, a central theme and concept that we've seen through this exhibition, through this conversation, just through the energy in here tonight, is the importance of an intergenerational connection, right? An intergenerational community support, paying the opportunities that we've received forward for those that come after us, right? That has been essential to this conversation and to this work. Um, this exhibition, this conversation would not have been what it is without the work that John did 25 years ago, right? And here we are celebrating 25 years later, and we will continue to celebrate in another 25 years. So for our last question, um, I would love to bring up some of our wonderful, talented student mural artists, Kedra, Noah, and Stephanie, uh, who are embodying this idea of paying forward to the next generation. So if I could have you three come up to the stage for our last question of the night, uh, please come join us.
were part of a group that we were able to work with where you learned about the art of storytelling, the history of black artists here in Buffalo through the exhibition. Um, and you have your work in, as, on view in the exhibition as well. So I wanted to bring you to the stage uh, to hear from some of our artists and then we'll hear from you about your experiences. But if, if our artists here could give some advice to the next generation, to the young people that we have here with us that are watching uh, this video, what advice would you give to the next generation of artists? Embrace the nose. <laughs> Go ahead. Maybe they, maybe they have a question they would ask that may be personally related to them as they're experiencing that, which could be answered by some of the more advanced or pros. Is there one? Um, yeah, um, earlier you mentioned how art can either be a profession or a hobby. How do you find out where you want to go? Because I'm really stuck in the middle with it at this point, mm -hmm. even though I'm like going to school to major in an art degree, but I'm not I think sure. just for a lead, maybe in some of this that you're doing this, you would either speak to John or some people with whom are connected with this organization and, and share that with them on a personal basis because it's a decision that you will be trying to make at some juncture. But I would rather somebody else could respond to that now. You, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, She's a gallery, so maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I was in your position before, and I struggled. So I would say uh, the last few jobs that I had, I always was thinking art. I brought my artwork to work with me when I wasn't supposed to. That's right. <laughs> and I did it anyway, swallow on the phone. And um, during the pandemic is when I made that conscious decision. I had enough money saved. I worked, 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 and saved. So there was a sacrifice that I did. I didn't spend any money really too much on me, meaning getting my hair done or doing other luxury things. Um, I saved that. So because I had a vision, of an art gallery, okay? And um, it wasn't until I went to go visit vacant spaces that I see my vision. Yeah. And now I, my, my art gallery wasn't as it looked now. It wasn't, it was holes in the wall. It was, I had to redo the floors. Um, and I didn't sign any paperwork yet, but I had to see the vision. I had to see the space. I had a vision. I seen the vision in this place. But what I'm trying to say is I stepped out on faith. Mm -hmm. I was absolutely afraid, okay? But I knew in my heart, I was going to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So if this is a struggle of yours, you have to see that vision. You have to see yourself actually making it happen because I did. And the first year, yeah, you know, during the pandemic, we all, all businesses struggled. Yeah. And I still pushed right through that. Mm -hmm. And I pushed through the second year of the pandemic. And, you know, I'm here now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's. Thank God. That's all I can say. Yeah. Thank I would God. say it's also. I would say it's also um, a matter of how you feel when you're sharing your work. Because mm -hmm. if you're sharing your work and maybe you feel hesitant about people even looking at it or maybe looking too close, then maybe you might want to keep it more of a hobby. But if you feel good about showing your work to a large yeah. amount of people or people having your work in their homes or doing work, because I feel like a lot of people when you're trying to make make a living as an artist, depending on what you want to do, you might end up doing a lot of commission work, which might not be work that you necessarily are drawn to or have an emotional connection with. So you might want to think about that stuff too, because that'll play a role. Like, are you more the type of artist that likes to make their own work? Do you like to draw stuff for other people? Like, is that something you would want to make money off of? Because it does become more of a job if you want to make it professionally. But if you think you might want it to be a hobby, it's a lot more open and you have a lot more time to maybe hone your skills or get more comfortable with people seeing your work. I'd say get your, like, get your work on. Like yeah, work. just work a lot keep, and see how you Keep feel. working and in every opportunity that you have, make the most of that opportunity, similar to what you're saying. Like every job that I, I knew that I wanted to work with youth. So every job that I had or every job that I applied to, I wanted to work with youth. My first job was working as a camp counselor. Mm -hmm. And um, I always had the creativity, but I would find a way to forge that into those processes. And one of the things that I learned throughout the process of working, just working nine to five and you know five to whatever, yeah. I, I learned that in every single job that I had, there's something that I'm learning that's going to give me what I need yeah. in yeah, order yeah. to be the that's greatest right. whatever it is that I'm trying to go towards. Do not, do not um, shy away from hard work mm -hmm. and also delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. If you learn delayed gratification and understanding that this career, this art 
world and this, whatever you're trying to do, it's not gonna just be like that all the time. It's some hard work and not only that, there's gonna be this internal process that you're gonna have mm -hmm. to go through where you're gonna have to um, balance your emotions with your responses, mm -hmm. okay? When people say that your work is not good enough, you have to, you have to know how to say, okay, let me dig in and see, well, where can I do better? Understanding how to take criticism. Mm -hmm. but, but work, work, work. Do not stop working and understand that every opportunity, everything that you're doing, just try to do the best that you can. Mainly, um, you're, gonna, you're gonna find many forks in the road. Absolutely. You have to figure out whether you're going left or right. As long as you believe in what you're doing and multitask. Yes. Nothing says, I mean, in the beginning, I got to a point where I can do art by itself. But people had that quote unquote thought as starving artists. You don't have to be a starving yeah, artist. That's right. You that's just right. figure out other things you can do in the process. Like um, Jalen said, as an entrepreneur, well, how can I do this to sustain myself, to make my car notes, to do my mortgage, but yet still do my artists? Because even now, and I went to high school, right up Street McKinley, I still got students who are just as talented, and in some cases, even more talented, that wish they had to stay with it, near at banks and everything else. And then they're still unhappy, you know, 50 years later. But me, I have no problem with it at all. I mean, you get to a certain point as you grow that it'll make the decision for you. You just have to believe in yourself and what you're doing and stick with it. And think about outside the box all the time. Oh, wait. That's right. Okay. Andrew Wife, I saw his documentary about his life and his work, and he said one thing that um, it's hard to accept, but it is the truth. If you want to be an artist, you're going to have to be selfish. That means that your family and anything else comes after you have decided the piece of work you're working on is done for the night. When my kids were little, I put my art to the side, and I focused on them. Um, I would do little things here and there, but I never thought anything would come of that because it was just something I, I simply, I had to do that. Um, but when they got older, then my whole world was doing this artwork, taking those stories that I wasn't able to write clearly the way I wanted to and putting them into a visual. And, um, yeah, it, and as hard as it is to believe, you do have to focus really on the art is first. Like you get up, you get dressed, or you don't get dressed, but you gotta do this little bit here. Okay, or oh, you gotta go, you got all, I got like thousands of pieces of pastel, but I don't have that dark um, violet. So I have to go and pick that up at the art store. And I really don't have six or seven dollars for that one piece, but that's the only color, you know, that's what I need. That's how you. That's how you decide. If it's a hobby, you put it off because you don't have the time and you don't have the money. But if it's a profession, yeah. nothing is going to get in the way. And perseverance. Perseverance is what I mean. And some patience. And one other thing I just suggest, and I'll turn it back over to the experts, is that is, don't show you paint to any and everybody. <laughs> if you're going to do that, prepare them for what you're trying to do so they can see that. Because the worst thing that can happen to you is trying to take advice from somebody who don't know what that is about. <laughs> <laughs> because it delays you. Perseverance, patience to a degree, and always a positive attitude. Don't go negative on yourself. If you drop paint on the whole thing and ruin it, just take count to 10, ask the Lord to forgive you, and go and do it again. <laughs> but the second time, I do want to just kind of bring it to know, and Stephanie, if you do have any questions as well, yeah. so that they can get more advice, but I do want to make space for you guys if you did have questions for any of the artists. I just want to thank Tiffany for bringing, the, bringing this gathering together. Yeah. This is a historic, <laughs> yeah. really you know, historic. For John and, 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 John and Tiffany, thank the Lord. Yeah. I mean, if it weren't for your presence, we wouldn't be, be here. That's right. And I just, again, want to thank you. <laughs> you started out trying to get that young lady, but you never got a chance. No, yes, please. Um, I think there's been points where 
Well, I've been creating, when I started creating, I hated art actually, mm. which is pretty funny because I had nothing else to do and I was kind of like a very dark point and then I realized that I kind of like ran to art and writing. Um, so sometimes over the years I've felt like contention because I know that's where it came from. It came from like, I needed to do this to survive. So part of me is afraid of um, stepping into like the world and um, losing my passion for it because mm. then where's my safe place gonna be? Mm. So um, I was wondering how you guys like pass that threshold of like, this is something that I live for, but also this is something that... <laughs> James. Yeah. That is going to be a lifelong journey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when the phone bill is due, <laughs> right. when you got to go to a job with that one coworker that gets on your nerves, you're going to always ask the question. But the trick is you get comfortable asking that question and answering it. Don't shy away from it. Um, if you're passionate about it, and you'll have other people that tell you different things. You know, Princess has said, you sometimes just got to step out on faith. And Brother Bell said, being persistent. And I'm going to tell you what it is for me. When I can't sleep because this thing is still gnawing at me to do it, that's going to push you through. That's going to give you courage. Right. That's going to give you desire and drive that you don't even know you have yet. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to be there. It's, not, it's going to be that monkey on your back. It's not going to let you alone until you answer it. Go for it, you know? Let's so, yeah. Betty and then Bree, and then we'll have to go one, to one word. Art is a gift to you. Mm -hmm. It's an individual gift, and it's wonderful. And so it's worth, it's going to lead you. It makes a pathway for you. You don't have to figure it out. It will lead you. Come on. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when you get there, you know it. Mm -hmm. Because you'll be happy and you'll be fulfilled. And whatever you need, money, friends, mm -hmm. comfort, um, a praise, <laughs> whatever you need, it will be there for you. Don't worry about it. It's got to lead you. Great. Yeah, really quickly, um, I understand what you mean about having that personal connection to art and being afraid to share it. I just encourage you to share it. Um, my father passed away in 2021 and I did a show, my first solo exhibition about it. It was so emotional for me um, and I was so scared to tell people about what I was feeling, but I did it. And I've gotten so many, so many people just telling me how it was important and how they related and how it, it showed them that they can use their creative outlet, no matter what it is, it doesn't even have to be art, that they can use that to impact other people. It's, you'll never regret it. It may be scary, but do it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Fear, do it anyway. You know, one, one thing I would like to do is one of our student artists, and she did a great job when we first started talking about that part of our project is called the art of storytelling. And before we started doing anything with paint, pencils, anything else, she had completely, verbally said what she wanted to do and how it was done. And I would like for her to share that experience with us and the process she went through. I think for me, art is my way of like expressing myself. Speak up just a little louder. For me, art Thank is you. my way of expressing myself because I'm not <laughs> that good with words most of the time. But I'm, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to do it because for me, art is just like a way of showing like who I am as a person mm -hmm. to people. And so I was grateful that my teachers <laughs> told me to come over here to do more with what I want to do. Because like, not only do I want to be like a scientist, but also like love art. And I want to, you know, try to have the best of both worlds. And so I'm grateful that, um, that I was given the opportunity to have something like that in my life because I like I come from McKinley like that school does not get a good rep as of lately so I'm grateful that someone took a chance on me and that they were a positive enforcement in my life that they allowed me to use art to express myself so I'm grateful that I had teachers mentors people that you know there's just like art is something you want to do and then you can do it so I'm grateful for all the advice that was given today because then I'll take that with me mm -hmm. for the for my future. And Jeanette had a few words to share uh, for our gen next generation artists as well. So we're going to just hear briefly from her and then we'll close out. And if you had a piece of advice for the next generation of artists, what would it be? Do what you feel. I love art. I just want to say thank you. Oh, oh go ahead, yeah, Brother Bell. Well, you can say, I just want to one little thing I wrote just to share with everybody. 
And, uh, Go ahead, Brother Brown. Okay. The floor is yours. It's something I wrote with one of my poems. It says, I'm happy. It's a great day to be happy. How else would I ever be? I'm feeling good. My spirits are high. Another day I will see. The life the Lord has given me with all my family and friends is a blessing of great proportion that I hope will never end. The joy that's in my heart today is one I can't explain. I'm in the bosom of Jesus, and there I will remain. It's a great day to be happy. There is no pressure on me. I have a friend in Jesus, and I'm happy because I'm free. Mm -hmm. I'm a deacon of the church, so wherever I'm at, if there's a meeting being held, everybody knows me. There's a prayer before it. I even did it in the Common Council. They said, go ahead, Brother Bell, and I pray in the name after me. So Jesus is the first thing in my life. Mm -hmm. Okay, I didn't want to try to convert you, but. <laughs> so I just want to thank you all so much for your time, your energy, your presence, your wisdom, everything that you've shared. This is truly history. Um, and so just thank you for being here and being a part of it. And this would not be possible without the visionary, um, the originator of sharing our view, this idea, uh, Mr. John Baker. So if you could just stand. Thank you, Tiffany, for what you've done. And I'd just like to say how grateful I am. And you just couldn't believe the kind of joy I have now, 25 years later, not knowing what my vision was then, that it would reach this point. But this would not have happened for me if not having Tiffany to come along from the birch fields, say, John, I'm thinking about doing this. What do you think? Amen. And me working out with her and having my beginning people with me, with Ben. With James and, and with the other James and the other people that are not here, like Mr. West, and Mr. Cooper, and some others. So don't think we just got here. Oh, well, I just got here. There were people before me that influenced me to get you to this point, and I'm looking to you do the same thing we did and pay it forward. Yes. And I do also want to just give a shout out to Jalen as well, who helped kind of facilitate and brought this idea of bringing us all together for this conversation um, and documenting this moment in history so that it lives on forever. So Jalen, I want to give you one more. I feel like this whole road should probably seen. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's not a bad idea. You know, we'll to the I mean, we can. I guess the whole row. I need to run this one. Oh, yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. You're just one other person I just wanted to make sure I mentioned, and that's Brother Bell. Yes. yes. You know, exactly. and reaching out to him, and him hearing the vision, and coming on board, just that connection because he's been around a lot longer than most of us. Some of us put together, he's been around. And just having this kind of experience, even in the art, is a very positive thing. So thank you, Brother Bill, for coming along. You might want to check this. out the Martin King Park, the, the room where you go to rest. We have a display in there that the group I chair built around the monument. The monument is an idea that we started out in the late 70s with. And it, it is uh, it's the largest, second largest tribute to Martin Luther King in America. And if you go into what you call that room right there, anyway, it's right next to the statue where you know it's on the wall in there. And we have another one coming up at uh, the community conversation on the 16th of May in the Science Museum. Two young ladies that are coming into town to have a conversation. One of them is an expert on Frederick Law Olmsted, the park designer. The other one is an expert on Dr. Martin Luther King. These are all black women, young women. Out of their backgrounds are Harvard, MIT, and Boston University. All of them have PhDs. And they have a tremendous knowledge. I had no idea that Frederick Law Olmsted did a tour of the South and stood up for equal opportunity and to have African Americans have access to everything he designed. You know about how popular that was because we're talking about the 1800s now. But Martin King stood for equal rights for humanity, and Frederick Law Homestead did. So that's the conversation that they're going to have 
and you're going to learn some stuff. And he's a very intelligent. And it's sponsored by the Olmstead Conservancy that runs all the parks. At Science Museum, the 16th of this month, Brother Bell gets to do the invocation. Then they turn them loose and they do the thing. Okay. I'm good, though.